Hello. Am I live yet? Let me just see. Oh, yes, I am live. Um, okay. Um, I'm a little bit early. I just want to make sure that I've um, got all the tech stuff right. Um, so please just bear with me for a second. Um, also, I'm using like multiple screens so that I can see everyone. Um, everyone's comments come in, hopefully. Um, and also share my screen. So I'm just going to wait till it's two before I get going. Um, if you can hear me, if someone is uh, watching and you can hear me, uh, just say something just so that I know everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, just want to be sure before I start. Um, cool. Mm -hmm. Make sure that I am not muted. Okay, so it's now 2 p.m. Okay, hey Sally, brilliant. Um, glad to hear, see that you can hear me um, and see me as well. Uh, brilliant, so let me try and get going um, with this for just one second. Okay, um, let me just share my screen. Okay, so where can I be? Right, cool. Just want to be sure that um, that can all be seen. So if you can see my screen, yep, I think we can. I'm actually on different screens so that I can make sure everything's running smoothly, uh, see where I'm placed, uh, see comments come in and um, see my notes as well. So um, I just wanted to make a quick note um, before I start. So I'm trying to work on being more accessible, but I couldn't really figure out how to add closed captioning while live. Um, so I'm recording this and I will pop it over to YouTube. And then I believe from there, I should be able to add in some automatic closed captioning and then bring it back to this page. So if that's something you're waiting for, it will be it will be coming. Um, so just hang in there. If you need a closed captioning, um, I will put this on YouTube after this is done. So, um, right. So let me just get that. Okay, brilliant. So um, obviously I'm talking about cooperative care today and I want to thank uh, Ruby very much for inviting me on to speak today. I've been really excited to do this so um, let's get going. Um, so yeah I'm doing cooperative care today and just so you guys know um, because of the way I'm doing it and I've got the presentation going I might not see everyone's comments right away um, and might only get to them at the very end just so you know if you have any questions and if I don't get to them um, live, I'll reply back in the comments. Um, but hopefully I'll have some time after this presentation to kind of look at what you guys are saying and get to you. Um, also, because sometimes when I do lives, I know some of the comments don't appear. So I just want you to know that I'm not ignoring you. Um, I just might not be able to see you uh, while I'm doing this. So just, just thought I'd say that. Um, there will be some videos in this presentation, so if um, they're a little glitchy and, and you don't see them running very well, um, I'm also going to put them up on YouTube as well, um, just so that you guys can see that. So I might make a little list of um, videos if they don't come out uh, very well um, over this format, um, but you'll be able to see something, so um, don't worry about that. So uh, let me just start off quickly by um, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Rachel. I'm the founder of Dog at Heart. And um, I got into training when I was a volunteer for a shelter in Singapore. Uh, that's where I also got my dog, Dave, the little brown dog you see there. 
He's a Singapore special, which essentially just means he's a mongrel, a street dog. And then I moved him from the shelter, um, which he had been in for seven years of his life, to Liverpool with me. I, and then I did the um, Victoria Stillwell Academy, uh, which I graduated from. Um, and since then, I've been just continuing to do lots of uh, further education. Um, so my main thing with clients is working on uh, cooperative care, of course, and reactivity issues. Now, Dave is 11 years old now. Um, I adopted him when he was nine. Uh, so, I mean, he's really, really healthy, um, but as he's getting older, I want to be able to prepare him for any sort of handling or any sort of vet procedures, you know, touch wood um, if he needs it someday. Um, older dogs, as you know, can need to see the vet a bit more often, and I just don't want it to be stressful for him. Also, um, when I knew Dave for two years while he was at the shelter, um, he was not really a cuddly kind of dog. You know, he doesn't behave aggressively if people touch him and that, but he's not one to sort of solicit being touched and then being petted and, and all that sort of stuff. So that's another reason why I felt like cooperative care would be um, great for him, um, you know help him build that trust with me and, and know that, you know, being touched is fine and maybe even nice. Um, and now, you know, after a year and a half since adopting him, um, he's got into his rubs. He loves those um, morning cuddle sessions. So that's always nice. Um, so the stuff that I'm going to talk about today are really just some areas of cooperative care. There are, of course, lots and lots more to it and I could probably go on for ages, but I'm just picking these few points to um, talk about today. Okay, so, right, so there's a little video here. I hope it doesn't lag on me, um, <laughs> but you'll just see a couple of things there. So um, oh, let's start with what is cooperative care. So in this video, um, you'll see me work on various procedures with Dave um, using various cooperative care techniques. Um, cooperative care is really, you know, about helping our dogs feel more comfortable during handling and husbandry, whether it's at home, at the vets or at the groomers, the dog is actually having a say in what is happening to them. So, you know, it's not just about them tolerating what's happening, um, but it's them actually participating willingly in what's happening to them. So when we work on cooperative care, our dog has a way to say, hey, I'm ready or you know, to stop what we're doing and either go back to an earlier step or we could give them a break and, and you know, maybe try again tomorrow or something like that. So you know, it's a conversation and we still wanna build up what we're doing with the dog. You know? um, so you know, if the dog is scared of having the ear drops done, uh, we're not just going to go straight into uh, doing that. We're going to build it up. Maybe we start at just hovering our hand near the ears or even just putting a hand out towards their face. Um, and then maybe we can start touching the ear gently, you know, things like that. So we don't go straight into something, obviously. Um, but, you know, throughout this entire process, um, the dog has the way to say, OK, I'm ready now. And um, I'll need a little break. Um, can we try this again? Can you make it easier? And, you know, we let them have that break. Um, oh, hello, Mara. Hello, Rachel. Hello, Charlotte. So I'm just seeing everyone's comments now. Everyone's saying hi to Davy. Yes. Um, <laughs> so why is cooperative care so important then? Um, I talk about cooperative care uh, wherever I get the opportunity to. So on things like my own social media, um, on podcasts that I've been invited to speak on, I just talk about cooperative care um, because I realize that so many pet caregivers, and this is not just limited to dogs, um, you know, any animal uh, will benefit from this, but so many pet caregivers and, and doggy caregivers don't realize that it's even a thing. And, you know, they'll tell me they wish that someone had told them that this was a thing when they got their dog. I mean, we see so many things about, um, you know, people saying dogs are drama queens when they have to get their nail clip and the dog is screaming or trying to pull away or run away and stuff like that. So uh, sometimes we have it internalized in us that um, 
dogs are just not going to like the vet you know they just don't like having these things done and so when we have that idea we end up not uh, doing anything to change it if that makes sense um so this is why I talk about it so that we can kind of undo that and think, hey, actually there is a better way. So, I mean, every dog in their life will need to see the vet at some point, right? Um, some dogs may also definitely need grooming, um, which they might not all be comfortable with. So it's really important that they feel better in these situations to reduce the stress that they are experiencing. The more bad experiences the dog has with handling and gets forced to be handled, um, the more their behavior can kind of escalate into a more aggressive type of thing, um, like maybe biting whoever's touching them, or they can get more sensitive about being touched in certain parts of their body or even generalize it to all of their body. So we don't want that to happen. We don't want our dogs to get to that stage, right? Um, as mentioned earlier as well, I also work on a lot of reactivity cases and cooperative care can be quite important because we really need to reduce the dog's overall stress to then be able to work on things that they are worried about, say, you know, when they're out on walks. Um, so when we have a dog who displays reactive behavior and but he's happy to, you know, be groomed at home with the brushing and nail clipping, and he's not overly stressed out when at the vets, then we're keeping the stress levels in general as low as possible so that when they are out on their walks, they're not already at a point where they have been stressed out by the grooming at home and, you know, they're up to here already. So they're not going to be so quick to react if, if anything happens, if that makes sense. So oftentimes we also find that um, some reactivity or aggression cases may have underlying health issues involved as well. So the dog may need to see a vet or may need to see a vet behaviors and they may, might need to go in more regularly. And so if they're more comfortable with being at the vet and being handled by the vet, then again, they'll be less stressed overall and they can get the medical help that they really need, you know, without struggling. Um, so I really love this quote from Dr. Carolina Westlund, um, control improves welfare and empowered animals are brave learners. By, control, by considering choice, we may uh, start having new conversations with our animals. You know, we as people control so much of our dog's lives as it is, where they live, where they walk, what they eat, uh, when they eat, everything, right? And that's not always a bad thing. I'm not saying like, you know, it's a bad thing. We got to keep them safe and all. Um, but having control and having choice is an important part of any animal's welfare. So if we can find ways to give them a little bit more control and choice that is safe, then we absolutely should. And so cooperative care helps dogs um, because having choice and having control over what is happening to them is so, so powerful. And I use this example quite often, but like imagine you have one dentist who you go to who doesn't care how you feel and they just go straight into doing what they need to. Um, and you might be like experiencing lots and lots of discomfort and lots and lots of break, uh, lots and lots of pain. You might really want a break, but you can't you can't stop until he's done. And then you get to rinse your mouth and have that break. But then you have another dentist who you go to who's like, right, if you need a break, raise your hand and I will stop. And you can go have a have a rinse of your mouth. Um, so which dentist will you feel more comfortable being around? Right. Um, you know, when we get a choice in what happens to us, it makes us feel safer. You know that you have some way of stopping what's happening or taking a pause. And that is the same for our dogs. So what I find is that through cooperative care, dogs learn to accept and willingly participate in all this handling and husbandry procedures much better in the end, because there's that um, empowerment and that trust in you as well. Trust that, you know, you're not going to go straight into doing something really scary. Um, he's going to have a bit more control over that, right? Okay, um, so I do want to make this point is really important. Um, in this little video, you see Dave doing uh, displacement behavior, like uh, licking himself. So that's a really big one for Dave when he's not really comfortable with stuff or I'm going making things too hard or doing things for too long, he starts licking himself. It's not very nice. <laughs> and also in the next clip, you just see him pulling his paw away from me, even though um, he's in a cooperative care position that I'm looking for. 
And so my point here is that even if our dog is doing the start button behavior or the cooperative care behavior, whatever, we still want to look for any sort of body language signals that indicate um, avoidance or stress, and then sort of stop what we're doing, reevaluate what we can do better and how we can make things easier for them, and then try and do better. So when we think about our sort of desensitization and, and counter conditioning process, we need to be working at a level that the dog is okay with and that they're comfortable with. So reading their body language is something that's really important. And I just really want to stress that. So, you know, we're not just going to go straight into um, stuff they're not comfortable with. We want to see how they feel about it for sure. Okay. So let's talk about normalizing equipment because quite often when working on cooperative care, we may need to use some sort of equipment um, in the process. So for example, things like nail clippers, um, you know, brushes, stethoscopes, um, ear drops, all that sort of thing. When you're working on this stuff, especially when it comes to um, more specialized equipment that vets have and maybe you can't easily get, that sort of thing, you don't have to have that, all right? Don't go out of your way to try and find stuff like that. Um, I love what Ken Ramirez says uh, about teaching our animals to expect the unexpected. So you don't have to go out of your way to get a stethoscope, although I know they can be quite cheap on Amazon these days, but you can use anything. And perhaps one of the things that you use is a cold spoon and that might give your dog a similar sensation to being touched by a stethoscope. Um, I use the word normalizing here because yes, it's, it's definitely about counter conditioning and desensitization. But what we can do to help as well is to just have the dog see these uh, sorts of equipment as being no big deal. They're just part of the environment, something that exists. They'll see all this sort of random stuff and um, they're like, oh, it's just one of those things. My human plays with me with all these random stuff. They touch me in this random stuff. I go to the vet and they touch me with random stuff as well. So, you know, it's not, um, uh, it, it's not a big, big, big deal for them. Right, so let me just check in my comments, everyone's all right there. Okay, so one of the ways that I do counter conditioning and desensitization or, or normalization of um, equipment and objects and things like that, um, that might be needed in cooperative care is through ACE free work. Um, there is a lot involved in free work and a lot to talk about there. And I can't go into all that detail right now. So if you would like to learn more about it, you can join Sarah Fisher's uh, Facebook group, Ace Connections. It's a fantastic resource. Um, and I believe Janet Finley also talked about this in her talk recently as well. So go check that out. But um, what I wanted to say um, just for what we are talking about in terms of cooperative care is that in free work, we'll have a bunch of different enrichment items, right? We, we won't have anything too difficult, like certain puzzle toys can sometimes be too difficult, but we'll have um, different enrichment stuff, you know, your snuffle mats, your licky mats, we'll have different surfaces for them to step on. Um, we'll have things maybe propped up at different heights so that they're not bending their head downs all the time. Um, and we'll have the dogs waterable. And so when our dog enjoys doing their free work and they're quite confident in doing it, we can then start to add something that they might normally not be so happy being around or, or having um, touch or, or being near at all. Um, so let's say your dog runs away when he sees the cone or the muzzle, we can put that into the free work setup and it'll just be there when your dog goes and, do, do, uh, and does the activity. And so that just becomes a normalized thing. It's just a thing, it's no big deal. Um, in this picture, you will see that a dog is doing free work. That's one of my client's dogs. Um, and there's a little white cloth that is circled in red, if you can see that. That little white cloth is some alcohol wipes because it's this dog finds the smell of it and other things like it, like, you know, your revolution drops, that sort of thing. Um, she finds them not very nice, a little bit aversive, and, and that impacts the training as well. So in this free work setup, the dog doesn't feel too worried about that. She can move away and she can get reinforcement further away from the, from the wipes and the smell of it, but she still chooses to engage with the stuff around it. So um, I find that free work can be really, really helpful. And you can do it with smells, with sounds and with objects. I'm just playing this video 
um, quickly for you guys right now. So this is Dave doing a little bit of a free work. I'm sorry, it's just a little bit laggy here. Um, but if there's a nail clipper placed on top of that uh, white box next to the brown licky mat. And um, <laughs> he's gone over to look at the planters. But um, so in this, um, the nail clip is just no big deal, right? It's just part of the environment, it's just there. Um, he's got lots of things to do, lots of things to eat around. And he goes um, for the licky mat next to it and he's completely unbothered by the nail clipper, which could potentially be something scary. So um, you can do this with all kinds of things. You can do this with sounds, smells, like I said, um, even surfaces, maybe your dog doesn't like getting on, um, you know, those um, metal stations um, at the clinic or, you know, even the weighing scale, things like that. Um, you can add like things into uh, the free work so that it becomes a little bit more normal. Okay, so that's enough of Dave. <laughs> Let me just check on the comments if anyone's okay. Good. So start buttons, um, right? So another way that we can help our dogs with um, feeling better about equipment is showing them that they can control when the equipment appears. So I've started doing it this way now after watching Eva Bertelsen and um, Emily Johnson Bay's talk at Cricket Expo, which means we are getting the start button behavior organically. So by um, having a good reinforcement um, pattern and then we start pairing the neutral object with a treat. So object, treat, object, treat, object, treat. Doing that multiple times in a rhythmic sort of way and then you pause and see what the dog does to get you to bring the object out again. So in this one you can see that the dog does this really nice head dip. Um, there we go, there it is. And then the, the human brings out the um, shower head, which is normally a scary thing. So I can just play that again for a little while in case you missed that. So there's the head dip, shower head. Um, so, you know, in, in this start button, it can be the most subtle, th subtle things like eye contact, um, weight shift, um, you know, like a head dip like this is really nice. So um, I find this way of doing it really, really good. And the animal learns that their behavior can make things happen. So even if it's the most like subtle sort of things, um, they, they have that control, right? So this is that, this is the same dog who was um, worried about the alcohol wipes and the um, revolution drops. So that's the same dog. So cooperative care behaviors. Now, like I said, um, there's a lot to cooperative care and I can go on forever, but I thought I'd mention um, some behaviors that your dog can probably already do. Maybe you have them as part of trick training. I love trick training for um, using them in cooperative care as well. Um, so I thought I'd talk about um, how that those behaviors, um, just a few of them can be useful in cooperative care because you might already have them. So if you've got a middle or peekaboo, as some people call them, um, that's when your dog goes between your legs. He can either sit or stand. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, just pick one. <laughs> and if you do that combined with a chin rest, um, that can be really nice practice for jugular blood draws. So you can use that at the vet as well. Um, I think that's quite a popular one that, that you might see around. Um, play dead. So uh, that's a really cute trick and Dave loves this one because he loves having a lie down. And you would have seen some videos earlier of Dave doing this. Um, so it's where your dog lies down on their side with their head on the ground as well. So I take that picture as a, yes, I'm ready. If the dog lifts his head or gets up, then I stop, right? So I love this one for accessing the dog's paws. You know, you can use it for just checking their paws, um, nail clipping, you wanna put on your paw balm, um, the uh, sort of paw for trimming, that sort of thing is perfect, I love it. Um, targeting's also really, really cool. Um, all kinds of targeting. So, you know, targeting a platform, I always think about, um, you, or even a mat as well, targeting mat as well. Um, when we go to the vet, right, the f often the first thing that they want to do with our dogs is put them on the weighing scale and weigh them. And um, that can be quite scary. So I remember the first vet that I went to with Dave, um, the weighing scale was in a corner and Dave doesn't like that. He doesn't like, you know, being 
too close to a wall or, or you know going through certain entrances where it's too narrow it doesn't like going into a corner like that so it was really really struggling uh, I was really really struggling with that and um, yeah it wasn't very nice and you know because it's the first thing um, when when the dog has that experience as the first thing when they step into the vet that just kind of ruins the whole um process doesn't it um it's like starting on 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 the wrong foot already so um that's not very nice but if your dog can target platforms it sees a platform and he's like oh yeah i'll get on that or if, if it doesn't like if your dog doesn't like um sort of metal surfaces that's okay you if your dog can target a mat you put the mat on the on on the weighing scale and then your dog just targets that so that's what dave does now you know we put the we put the mat on i mean it doesn't weigh that much and then you just ask your dog to get on the mat so that's what i really like with that um so all kinds of targeting targeting um, with their nose targeting their head into things and that's great for like putting the muzzle on or um, one of those elizabethan cones on for when they're not well so you can practice that outside of the times that they are not well um, and also targeting different parts of the body so you know if you got a sort of rear foot target um that's really good because you can sort of get more access to the back feet which can be sometimes a little bit difficult or the back legs sometimes it can be a little bit more sensitive but if you have that rear paw target that can help um and one of the things that i've been working on with dave is him targeting the top of his muzzle onto my palm and then that way i can lift his lips just a little bit um to check his teeth so we're working on that right now um and then you have your chin rests which are really, really handy. Um, I like using it for sort of working around the dog's head and neck. So things like eye checks, ear drops, um, ear cleaning, eye drops, nose drops, all that kind of stuff, right? Everything around the head. Um, I do try to set out to have different cooperative care behaviors for handling different parts of the body. Um, that way your dog is clear on what they're opting into. But I will admit that I lapse on this a bit myself. For example, you'll see that I use a chin rest for handling other parts of the body as well. And the part of why I did that is because Dave is so comfortable with his chin rest. It's such a strong um, thing. And, um, you know, and, and, and he knows what he's doing. Um, later, you see something um, where he sort of lifts his head and stuff. Um, and he can do duration nose targets, which I initially use for sort of doing stuff around the rest of his body but it can be a little bit difficult sometimes because he might sneeze and, and stuff like that so um we're working on that slowly there's other things that i do for accessing the rest of his body like um platform targeting as i mentioned and uh Sharak patel uh drag patel's bucket game um so there's a lot a lot of that so let me just see okay so what do you do when you need to just get it done, right? This is what a lot of people ask. So maybe your dog just needs to get something done right now. So like maybe he just needs to get his ear drops in right now and he needs it all, like every two weeks or, or something like that. And you haven't done much cooperative care with him to, to work on this. So what can you do, right? So if your dog is fine at the moment and you want to be able to prepare him for situations that you're not prepared for or perhaps things that um, you know is going to take a really long time to be comfortable with like eye drops because that sensation of having stuff go into your eyes can you know be uncomfortable like no matter how much you try and condition it sometimes um, or then pain that can also be a little bit more difficult. Um, so passive restraint which is something that I learned from Ken Ramirez is one thing you can work on right now. And you see that I'm doing this with Dave um, on a platform. So what you do is have your dog comfortable going onto a station or on a platform and then work up to this point where I am with him. You can also do it lying down, but um, with, the, with the platform, um, your dog might not be comfortable with the restraint right away. So just do sort of touches, gentle touches until you're able to have both hands around them or sort of arms around them and then eventually have some pressure while your arms are around them and then some duration to go along with that. 
you can also do, do this in that flat position, as you can see in my video. Dave likes this one. He just likes having a lie down, of course. Um, little guy. Right. So the other thing that you can do if you just got to get things done now is change the context. Now, what does that mean? Um, it just means that, you know, if you're working on something um, with cooperative care, and you also need to do something right away, just make sure that the context of how you're doing the stuff you need to do right away is different from your training context. So let's say your usual training place is the living room. Um, so then if right now you know your dog needs the ear drops and you just need to do it, then maybe you can do it in the kitchen and don't even try to ask for the cooperative care behavior or the start button or anything like that. Don't even like do that just go and do it. Um, the reason why is we don't want to poison the, the training. We don't want to poison the training context. We don't want to um, make it hard for them to say yes the next time, right? Um, because when we work on cooperative care, like I mentioned, we have to do it at their pace and, and where they're ready. So if we want to ask for cooperative care, then we're not going to push them into just doing it right away. Um, change the context, make everything different if you have to, um, so that it's nothing like your training context. You know, don't use your training mat, don't use all of that, just go and do it. Okay, let me just check on comments. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, this is Dave with a vet and he's doing his chin rest. He's not 100%. You can see his eyes are quite dilated and he's a little bit cautious. Um, and you see him sort of trying to look away, but he's like, oh, I'll keep the chin rest. I'll, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> but he did so, so well. And he was great with being touched everywhere. This was the first time he met this vet and he was pretty good. I mean, she was able to lift his legs and all that. Um, but yeah, the big question is, this is all well and good. Uh, my dog can do lots of stuff at home. Uh, but the moment the vet or the groomer is involved, everything goes down the drain. So that can be quite a common problem. And we can look at that. So the first thing you got to do is really find out uh, what the procedure looks like from your vet. Okay, so if your dog is getting their blood drawn, where on the body is that going to happen? Because there are multiple places that can happen. Um, same goes for injections, right? Um, where is that happening? So find that out. Um, have some rough idea of what the equipment they're using might look like. Um, that can help, although like mentioned before, um, preparing your dog for novelty is a good way to work with that. So that's regardless of whatever equipment the vet is using. But it's good to know um, the, sort of the average shape and then you can add that sort of thing into your training context as well. Um, what position does your dog have to be in? Do they need to stand? Do they uh, need to lie down? Is sitting okay? Um, you know, maybe laying flat, is that okay? Um, what position should they be in? And then will the lights be on or off, right? So when it comes to eye checks, sometimes they'll need to see your dog's eyes in the dark. So that's something you can prepare for and something you can ask about, because if you're training your dog to be more comfortable with eye checks and you've been practicing this whole time in a brightly lit room, when you suddenly go into a dark room and there's a bright light shining into the eye, that context is very different from when you were training it, right? Um, so find out about that. That can be quite a big thing. Um, Another thing to, to note is how long would a process be? So if they're measuring something from your dog or they're working with your dog on something where he has to be still for, I don't know how long, uh, find out how long that would take, right? So if they say one minute, prepare for more, okay? Um, just over prepare. If they say one minute, practice for five, it, it's fine. Um, other questions as well that you can ask your vet is how close would the vet have to get to them and how many people would need to be involved in this sort of procedure just because um, you can actually practice this and we'll look at that soon um, you know if you've got a dog who's sort of more sensitive um, with people being really close to them that might be something you want to work on um, things like that so 
uh, that's always good information to find out. But we can't always prepare for everything. And I know sometimes it's not realistic to prepare for everything, or sometimes things may come up more urgently, um, things like that. And, and it might not be perfect all the time. But, you know, the more information you have, the more you can do to help your dog be ready. And I feel like any little bit you do is better than not doing anything at all. So um, just do whatever you can. Right. So in this video, you'll see uh, my partner, human Dave, being my assistant. That's his weekend job. Um, and he doesn't train with Dave much. So he walks with Dave. Sometimes he plays with Dave. Um, he feeds Dave sometimes, but he doesn't train um, Dave, so to speak. Um, so a great thing to do is also practice with someone so that your dog learns to work with another person and someone other than you handling them. Um, so they get comfortable with someone other than you handling them. Um, it doesn't matter that it's just your partner, just your, it's just your spouse or just other family members that your dog already knows. It's just the idea of learning to work with multiple people at once and learning to work with someone other than you. Um, another pro tip is that when you're working with an assistant, uh, try to be very specific with what you're asking them to do. Uh, where are they to touch your dog? For how long? Um, what sort of pressure should they use? Uh, which end of the equipment should they be using? All that kind of stuff. It makes a big, big difference. And, um, you know, it makes it clear for them, makes it clear for your dog as well. Oh, here you can see the um, sort of simulation of the jugular blood draws. Obviously, um, human Dave is not a vet, so he doesn't really know where he's poking, but it doesn't matter. He can poke anywhere and um, and Dave is learning to get more comfortable with boy being poked around a little bit. So but you can see it's that middle position and a chin rest and he's he's all right there. Um, so, yeah, like you say, so so be very clear with your instructions with with whoever is your assistant. Um, you can set up markers for them as well. So you can get them to walk to a cone you've set up when your dog does a chin rest, for example. So when your dog chin rests, they walk over. Oh, and then when you click and treat, they walk away. So be really specific and um, you can get <laughs> tiny, tiny stickers and stick them on your dog, um, just really lightly stick them on your dog so that um, your helper knows exactly where to touch them as well. So you can do that. So use markers for your helpers. Um, there's Dave doing a little bit of an eye check type of thing. So, He's just getting used to working with someone else other than me. And I find that that can be really, really helpful. Okay. So you can also prepare your dog by practicing cooperative care stuff and a general training, a trick training, all that kind of stuff in different environments. Uh, Laura Monaco Torelli calls it husbandry on hikes, and it's exactly that. So, you know, who says you can't train, uh, you, you, who says you can't trim your dog's nails while you're on a walk, right? Um, so when you practice in different places, when it comes to you going to the vet, your dog might just see that as just one of the many places you practice this stuff. And um, so you can see that I do it on walks and we do it in the garden as well. So even though we've got a training room, we'll do it in different places, right? Um, and I put a little tip here is that um, the area outside your vet clinic can also be somewhere that you practice uh, because with COVID, if your vet can't let you in, you can just work on this stuff outside or in the car park or something like that. Um, again, doing something is better than doing nothing. So um, you can try that as well. Now, this brings me to my final and last point. Um, when it comes to working with your veterinarian, um, I Ideally, the best thing to do is find a vet who will work with you. So someone who values the benefits of cooperative care as well and, you know, sees it as a great way to reduce their stress and keep them safe as well when they're handling dogs. Um, you can see if there are fear-free vet practices in your area as they would know about cooperative care stuff. 
Um, alternatively, you can also try a house call vet for more routine things, so not for surgeries, obviously, but you know, routine things like vaccinations, body checks. I think there's a lot more these days that house call vets can do. They've got all this portable equipment, it's fantastic. Um, so if there is one available in your area, you can try them um, because your dog would probably feel more comfortable when they're at home. And you might also be able to have more time to work on the procedure with the vet. You could also probably sort of um, pay them to get them out to, to practice the cooperative care stuff with you before the actual procedure as well. So having said that, though, your vet doesn't have to be fear free certified and doesn't have to be a house call vet. If you have a good relationship with your current vet now, um, Sorry, I got distracted by comments. Um, if you have a good relationship with your vet now, um, you can work with them on these things and just explain to them the, the benefits of cooperative care um, in a way that helps them as well. So you could show them um, what your dog can do and that um, this is something that you can do with them so that you know when your dog needs stuff done, um, it's so much easier for them as well. And, you know, sometimes people worry about this time it takes but i feel like there's not too too much of a, a difference if we think about if a dog is struggling really hard and you're trying to hold them down that can that can take some time as well and you know induce even more stress and even more fear and you know everyone's stressed out so if maybe we just take an extra 10 minutes doing um, some of this cooperative care stuff and, and helping our dogs feel a little bit better that's that's worth that little time investment you know um right so once you've got the right vet practice to work with you know you've got a vet that 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 is on board with you you know completely understands all this stuff and 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 um, is really happy for you to try all this cooperative care stuff. Um, you can ask to do some happy vet visits where you take your dog there just to sniff, uh, play, eat, maybe train a little bit if your dog is feeling up to it. This is really good if like you've got a puppy as well, you know, um, take them to the vet for fun if you can. Um, Ideally, it's also good to do this when it's quiet. So maybe during the lunch break or after hours, um, let them know. Um, as mentioned earlier, during COVID times, um, they might not let you in, unfortunately. And so doing this stuff outside the clinic and in car parks and things like that, that can be helpful as well. So anywhere in the vicinity, um, these are all things you can do because there's going to be smells and there's going to be all that kind of thing. And, and maybe the vet might come out and, and say hi. So, you know, the, the, you can still do stuff during COVID-19 times. Um, and also, you know, the journey there, some dogs recognize the whole uh, journey to the vet and they, they start crying in the car before they they even reach the place. So, you know, just driving there for fun, uh, driving back. That's brilliant. Um, a lot of dogs, uh, sorry, not a lot of dogs, a lot of people are also concerned that um, right now you can't go into the clinic with, with your dog, right? So uh, like I mentioned, so that's um, definitely really difficult and it can be quite heartbreaking to just sort of, bye, bye doggy, you'll be okay, I'm outside, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but this is where all your practice with your various assistants um, can help you because um, your dog learns to participate with different people handling them. So different people working with them, different people touching them. And like I say, even if you just practice with family members, that already helps. So um, when COVID uh, is a little bit better and, and, and we can all sort of see our friends again, when you have friends come around, get them to do some cooperative care with your dog, you know, um, just just the more your dog practices with, with different people, um, the better they'll get when, when it comes to the real thing, so to speak. So um, but another thing you can do is try and ask your vet if they're willing to set up a little video call while they're with your dog um, and you can pass them your dog's treats, your dog's mat, whatever. Um, that way you can walk them through how they can work with your dog. So you can tell them, hey, my dog does a really good chin rest um, to show he's comfortable and ready. And when he lifts his head, he just wants a little break. And I can walk you through how to do that and how, how to get him to do that and, and how it works. So um, try just try requesting for that. And, you know, it does make their lives easier, especially if your dog is, is pretty comfortable working with people. So that's a big thing that can help. 
All right, so that is it really. Um, thank you all for joining me today and for your positive reinforcement. You can find me on Instagram. Uh, it's, it's dog underscore at heart. And if you want to follow Dave, because I know Dave is, is quite a character. Uh, if you want to follow him, it's Dave underscore the underscore dog over the O's and zeros. And my website is dogatheart.co.uk. And you're welcome to drop me a message there if there's anything you'd like to talk about. And so I will get into looking at the comments now. Just want to make sure that everything is okay. All right. So stop me share um, back to me and I'm looking at comments on another screen so sorry about that um oh thank you Sally thank you for that positive reinforcement um <laughs> everyone loves Dave I know um <laughs> he's such a guy he's such a dude um yeah I mean if we can work on cooperative care when um, our dogs are puppies, that would be so amazing, right, Charlotte? Um, I, I almost wish that this was a staple in every sort of puppy program because it, it's just such a big thing. And uh, like I say, if people, I mean, and this is not to point fingers or anything, it's just that we get so used to the idea that there are just these things that dogs would never like, you know, oh, they always hate nail clipping, they always hate going to the vet, nobody likes going to a vet. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not going to be the best thing in the world, but we can help them feel a little bit better about it. You know, some things like if there's going to be blood drawn, if there's going to be injections, if they have to, you know, be restrained or anything like that. Um, it's not going to be fully comfortable when I'm not saying that, you know, the dog has to love being jabbed with needles or anything. Um, but and, and we're not going to practice with, you know, actual needles. Like I said, you just practice with whatever you got, the blunt of the pen, um, any any little thing that you can touch your dog with, you just do that. But um, yeah, I mean, it would be so nice if we could you know, have that in our sort of puppy programs. I don't do sort of puppy programs so much these days, but if anyone else who does um, wants to think about adding that in, that would be amazing, right? So, and, you know, puppies, for the first time they go to a vet, they don't know it's the vet. Um, they'd probably be quite okay. So that's a really nice time to start as well. Um, and also the groomers. So, you know, today I talk a lot about vets, but a lot of this stuff applies with your groomers as well. They're also fear free groomers as well. Um, so, yeah, free work, brilliant. Um, yeah, trimming nails out on a hike. That was from Laura Monaco Torelli. I, I really like that as well. And um, I want to tr trim Dave's nails in the garden because he loves being in the garden and he's like lying flat and, and being really cute. And um, he's just so relaxed out there and he's not bothered by. Um, noises too much so that's something I, I want to try start trying with him I've started getting him to sort of play dead um, in the garden so he'll do that now and um, I'm just gonna work up to doing the nails a little bit um thank you Sally thank you Mara yeah I, I don't know why I don't know um, Mara I guess it's it's building i think there's a lot of people who are doing cooperative care now um which is nice it's really good to see um and hopefully that will grow as well because it's just so important and it's like i said it's just something that every dog and every animal like we need doctors right every animal needs um this and um you know, even if they're super healthy, maybe they need brushing, maybe they need nail trimming, they need their teeth brushed, um, all that sort of thing. So, um, you know, as much as you can do, the better it is, right? Um, oh, hello, Rachel. Oh, let me just see this comment. Last vet visit we had was great, was able to send Lily in with her mat and instructions on how it was her start button and the vets used it in her exam and injections all went great. That is fantastic. I love hearing stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's really, really good. I, I'm, I'm changing, I'm in the process of sort of changing vets at the moment. Um, last time I was able to um, pass um, the treats to the vet, which was like smelly salmon for Dave, and I did use it. Um, and they said he was good, he was fine. Um, but I think he struggles with the vets there because he's a little bit 
more worried um, with men sometimes. And so um, both the vets there are men. Um, he's okay with the vet tech who's a lady. Um, so that was a little bit difficult for him, um, but he did eat the treats and, and they said it was okay. It's, it's so hard in COVID-19 times, right? To send them off, but we gotta do what we can and we gotta ask, um, we gotta try all this stuff. Um, brilliant, uh, really nice to hear that, Rachel. So uh, sadly, I'm planning to focus on these things as part of my puppy packs. It's so important for any animal's life. Yes, yeah, Sally, please put that in your puppy stuff. That would be amazing. Do you have any resources on the start button? Okay, yeah. So um, start button, um, like the way I was showing it, um, you know, that organic style. Uh, that's from Eva Bertelsen and um, Emily Johnson Bay. So I'll try and put in the link and they might have some courses on in Tromplo. And I know there's a webinar from them coming up. Um, so maybe that would be something that where they'll talk about. So I learned that off Click Expo this year and I actually really, really love it because normally I teach um, cooperative care behavior sort of separately. So never thought about, you know, doing it so organically, but it's been working really well with a lot of my clients. So I find that pretty awesome. So I'll get back to you, Mara. I'll try and send you, put in some links here. Um, yay, Hillary, hello. Um, definitely gonna include it in puppy program. Yay, put it in the puppy program. Such good info, thank you. Never thought of taking nail trims on the road. Yeah, I know. I mean, one thing that I've been thinking about is brushing on walks as well, because if I brush at home, it's shedding season, right? There's furs everywhere. So um, that's a good thing. Just do it um, outside, do your nails outside. Don't have to clean it up in the house. Don't have to vacuum it. Um, just good compost, isn't it? Um, yeah, so brushing, you know, all that kind of stuff. You can do it um, in, in places that are fun and, um, you know, make it fun for them. That's really good. Um, I'll just hang on for another couple more minutes just to see if any other questions come in and then I'll end the session. Uh, for anyone who missed the start, I mentioned that I will be, um, I am recording this, yes I am recording this, and I will put it on YouTube and uh, closed captioning will then become available. Um, that way if you need closed captioning or if you need anything like that, um, that will be there for you. So I'll, I'll pop this back into the um, event page just so that anyone who needs closed captioning has it. Um, I will also maybe try to put up some transcripts. We'll see how I get on with that as well. Um, so let me just see if anyone got any comments. So really nice to see everyone. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, good. Good. Good, good, good. So um, if anybody wants to see Mr. Dave, right, um, he's just got up and he's doing a shake off and uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got a question. Um, I mentioned about how do I tackle a situation where the dog already associates? Okay, how do you tackle a situation where the dog already associates? Um, for example, eye drops with bad things happening. Brilliant. So what I would do in that situation is I would start with something more neutral. So because eye drops already has that um, negative conditioned emotional response, um, I would start with something neutral. So I'm just going to reach over and get something. So so we can work on those start buttons um, that you will see when you go back and look at the recording. Um, we can use something that is sort of bottle shaped, but is not the eye drops. Your dog will know the difference. Um, so let's say this is the eye drop bottle, right? Um, and then you get another bottle that is maybe bigger and, and totally different, doesn't have the same smell. So you work on that bottle first. So you work on things um, coming sort of towards him, not touching him, don't, don't touch them to start. I, I always play it safe and I don't touch the dog to start. Um, so you might bring, let's say this is the bottle, you just bring it over, bring it over to their, their near them. Um, or you can even just bring it in front of them for now, um, just wherever your dog is most comfortable. So this is, let's say this is the neutral bottle now, right? So you just bring it and then 
can treat, bring a treat. So um, you start with the neutral object and then um, also get them going in understanding how to do a start button behavior. And then once they do that, um, once, they're, one, once they're able to understand that their behavior um, can control things, can make things happen, you can slowly start to introduce the scary bottle now. Okay, so you start with something neutral, you start with something neutral, you do it a couple of times, you do it with various things, you do it with all kinds of things, you do it with your muzzle, you do it with, um, I don't know, a pen, you do it with your brush, you do it with everything, and you also do it with your scary eye drop bottle. Um, and then you come back to the recording and you will see I also mentioned something called free work, which is how you make scary things just a little bit more normal, a little bit less of a big deal. So um, just putting it, that into the free work environment and then your dog will um, be sort of okay with that, um, just sort of being there. So it's not there's less avoidance. And I mean, they can choose to not go there but they can also choose to sort of be near that thing. Um, when it comes to eye drops as well, sometimes there's a little bit of a scent. Um, so if you could um, start by having the bottle closed, so I'm just thinking out loud now. Um, so let's say we're doing the pairing, we're doing the um, eye drop, treat, eye drop, treat, eye drop, treat, and also start button, eye drop, treat, start button, eye drop, treat. Um, so we do that first with the eye drop bottle closed, and then we might do it with the eye drop bottle open because then there's a little bit of a scent, a little bit of a smell that maybe your dog was initially not comfortable with as well. So, so after closed eye drop bottle treat, you can do open eye drop bottle treat, start button, open eye drop, uh, eye drop bottle treat. So sorry, mechanics is really hard to do when you have to say it out loud, um, but if that makes sense. So, um, oh, great. I'm glad that makes sense for you. Um, there will be a couple of things um, that we mentioned. I think the timings are funny because of uh, sort of daylight savings and things like that. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, oh, yeah, David is a superstar. He is fun. Um, okay. And if there are no more questions, I will probably end the stream soon. Thank you all so much for joining me. Um, it's been really good. So just hang on for a couple of minutes and I'm glad I managed to see all the comments as well. Um, I'm glad I used three screens today. So that's good. Okay. So, all right, so I'm gonna go. Um, if there is anything that anyone wants to talk about and that I've missed, um, you know where to find me. Um, I'm on Instagram quite a lot, so you can, of course, come and come down and message me and DM me, or you can go to my website and, and talk to me there. Um, you know, um, I'm available. So, I, I, and if you have any other comments as well and you want me to answer them, I will put, I will reply you in this um, in the stream as well. Um, sorry, in the comments of the stream as well. So yes, thank you everyone. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you. I can't go through everyone, but thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, see you next time. Bye.